The second method is to convert a dimension to a constraint. So let's go about doing that. Let's place a dimension again. But this time we're not going to we're going to leave the constraint checks checkbox off and just place the dimension as normal. Again using tentative snap on the points. And let's just place the dimension as normal. Now we have to look at a new palette again. This one is called Parameter Constraints. Of course all these palettes are named and found under the D design as well. So this one is Parameter Constraints. If you look at the first icon on that palette, it says Convert Dimension to Constraints. So let's select that. And then we're asked to identify a dimension to convert. Let's select this dimension and accept and we get a dialog box requesting a variable name. So let's type in a variable name. Distance 2. Hit return. And once again, our solution is well defined. Our point is now white. We have some text with the value. And let's just test it. And we can see. Everything is hunky-dory. So let's look at the third method for is for creating dimensional constraints. Assign a variable to a dimension. And this is my preferred method and I'm for many ways. I, I uh, after using dimension driven design for a long time this just naturally falls into being the best way to do it I find. So what we do here is we assign a variable, we think about a name for a variable first before we're adding dimensions at all. And we simply do that simply by placing text in the file anywhere we like. Let's call this one distance tree. And I just place the text first. Now I place the dimension as usual without a constraint. Like so. And to assign a variable to a dimension, we go back up to this tool palette here and say assign variable. We're asked to identify a variable, so we identify the text we have entered, which is distance 3. Then we identify the constraint, which is going to be our dimension, and accept. Now you notice something different has happened here. Instead of making a well defined solution, our point is still yellow and our text that we entered has changed to yellow as well. This is because this variable is a driven variable rather than a driving variable. These ones here are driving variables because we can directly tell them what they should be and they will follow suit. We can even um, modify the dimension and it works backwards that way as well. But with this one, although it still works the same way, why isn't it fully defined? Well, the answer is in that little equal sign that's in the middle. That's the equal sign tells MicroStation to set the amount, whereas without the equal sign, it tells MicroStation to get the value. Let's just test that. Why don't we just put an equals in there and see what happens? Just, just simply by editing the text, and now I reevaluate the solution. I can see it's well defined. I'm going to undo that and look at another way to put the equals in. If you remember this constant constraint which locks all degrees of freedom, if we apply that to our variable, it automatically enters the equals and it sets the value and our solution is correct. So that's the three different ways create dimensional constraints. And how to change our values as well. The reason I like to use the last method is one, you can decide where your text goes and what rotation it is. With these I have um, MicroStation has decided where to place the text and what rotation on it. 
So I like to I like to be a step ahead and have that where I want it. Um, as well as that, it prompts you to think of proper names before placing dimensions without placing them dimensional constraints all over the place. It pr it, it it promotes better practice by making you think about a good variable name before placing your dimensions. And finally, before I jump into the next video, I better mention the rules governing naming of variables because it's very important. So we go into the help file and scroll down a bit. We have a little bit of um, text here explaining a few things to us. A variable name can have up to 32 characters beginning with a letter or underscore followed by letters, numbers or underscores with no embedded blanks. Variable, variable names are case sensitive. And you can read on through there. So that's very important. Variable names are case sensitive. So if you have um, a capital D at the start of that and you put it into an equation later on, which we'll get to in a minute, it needs, it needs to have a capital D in the equation as well. You can't use anything but letters a to Z, that's uppercase and lowercase, are the numbers 0 to 9. You can also use a special character, the underscore, which helps to um, helps to make your variables a little bit more readable. However, you might run into some problems when using the underscore character because in the default setup for MicroStation, under preferences, if we go to text and we look at this setting here, ed character. That is an underscore, and that's what's used for creating data fields, if you use data fields. So if you place an underscore in a variable, it might actually interpret it as a data field instead. So probably the only solution is to change your ed character to something like maybe tilde, or some other unusual character, maybe carrot or something like that, rather than the underscore. So just be aware, if you find there are problems happening with your variables, that could be the cause of them, if there's underscores in them as well. And remember, no spaces either. Okay, that'll do it for that video.